It's February 15th, 1862. John Floyd, Gideon Pillow, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, and Simon Bolivar Buckner are all together trying to decide what to do. Earlier in the morning, they had broken U.S. Grant's lines and had an opportunity to escape, but they didn't take advantage of it. And now Grant has them in circle. Floyd, the former Secretary of War, was like, no, my head would be too much on a picket because I'm the former Secretary of War, so see you guys, I'm going to go on and get out of here. Pillow, you're in charge. Pillow, I don't want this responsibility. Um, Simon, you got this. Nathaniel Bedford Forrest is like, well, I'm disgusted at the sheer cowardness of these two, and I'm not going to allow my cavalry to be captured, and he takes his cavalry up, leaving poor Simon Boulevard Buckner, a Kentuckian, alone, the guy who had been third in command, now in command. Buckner looks across the line, knowing his dear friend, U.S. Grant, is on the opposite side. So he sits down and writes a letter in the early morning hours, hoping that Grant will come up with the terms of peace. Charge. I'm here at Fort Donaldson National Battlefield Park uh, and I'm excited about this video series because I'm going to be following U.S. Grant's Western campaign and the victories he had at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga. But before I go any further, remember to hit that subscribe and notification bell so you're aware of any time I upload stories about the Civil War or any of my other class videos for um, film study with conversations with filmmakers or recent U.S. history. So let's talk a little bit about U.S. Grant, who is going to get his nickname Unconditional Surrender here at Fort Donaldson. But who is Grant? Let's rewind a little bit and we'll find out. Grant was born in Ohio on April 27, 1822, but it was an entire month before his family met to name him Hiram Ulysses Grant. But no one in his family will call him Hiram, and he'll be known as Ulysses. The representative who nominated Grant for West Point, though, made a clerical error in writing his name as Ulysses Simpson Grant. When Grant was surprised at the incorrect name upon arrival in 1839, he protested, but was told it would take time for the clerical error to be corrected. To not cause complications, he accepted Ulysses S. Grant as his name. The error, though, did create relief, as a 17-year-old 5'1 Grant was glad that the older cadets would never know his correct initials, Hug. At West Point, Grant will graduate with the class of 1842 and was a middle-of-the-pack student who excelled in horsemanship. He became pals with some of the older students, James Pete Longstreet, who will be by Grant's side at his wedding, William Tecumseh Sherman, known to his friends as Cump, and George Thomas. Grant also developed a strong friendship with class of 1843 member Kentuckian Simon Bolivar Buckner. Following graduation from West Point, Grant served the U.S. Army with distinction as a quartermaster during the war with Mexico. Yet, prior to the Civil War, Grant has a reputation of being a failure and drunk. Why? Let's take a quick glimpse. As the California Gold Rush took the small town of San Francisco from less than 500 people in 1847 to over 100,000 people in 1849, Grant saw financial opportunities awaiting for him. So, in 1853, when he was stationed up near Vancouver, Canada, he's like, you know what? Those people in San Francisco, they're going to need some ice. So he started cutting ice. A lot of it. A hundred tons of ice. That's right. One hundred tons of ice. He puts it on a boat, lets it go down the coastline. This isn't the coastline of California, by the way. 
sells it down the coastline of California, but the boat captain, he decides to take his time and takes two weeks. All the ice, it melts. Way to go. Ugh, that's some bad luck. But Grant's like, all right, no big deal. So he's like, people are going to need chickens. I'm going to buy all the chickens around Vancouver. And he does. Buys them all up. Puts them on a boat. Sets himself down California again. Only this time, one of the chickens had a virus on a boat where they were all contained. And that virus spreads and nearly every single chicken dies. Oh my gosh. He tried ventures after ventures. He leased a hundred acres of land around Vancouver to grow potatoes and things of that sort to send down to San Francisco. And then it rains and floods and all of his crops are gone. Talk about bad freaking luck. That's just, that's just bad luck. Grant was promoted and transferred in January of 1854 to a fort in Northern California, only to find himself nearly completely alone and very depressed. Therefore, like many in his position, Grant will start drinking. A lot. A whole lot. And under the threat of being court-martialed, U.S. Grant will resign his commission, but before going back home, he will make a stop in New York to collect an old debt from a friend who owed Grant a sizable amount of money. However, the person that owned him money skipped town. Some friend. Grant is now penniless, and he could not even pay his hotel bill. Fortunately, his West Point friend Simon Boulevard Buckner covered Grant's bill for him. Now don't forget to spit a friendship charity as we'll come back to it later, but that's a good friend. Grant returns to Missouri to try farming with his in-laws, only to fail. Desperate, he will end up selling firewood on the street corners of St. Louis while searching for jobs, but luck continued to go against him. Finally, in the fall of 1859, he was offered a well-paying job that he took, only to have the employer die a month later, killing Grant's job. You can't make this up, but Yules clearly seemed cursed with bad mojo. Eventually, Grant went back to work for his father in Ohio to find that he would have to serve under his younger brothers. Slightly embarrassing, but at least it was a job. When the war broke out in April of 1861, Grant returned to service. As he wrote to his father, There are but two parties now, traitors and patriots, and I hereafter to be ranked with the latter. Grant's reputation of being a brilliant quartermaster during the Mexican War caused the governor of Illinois to ask Grant to lead the undisciplined, newly recruited troops. Grant was able to quickly bring order to the Illinois militia and was promoted to Brigadier General by the summer of 1861. When Confederates violated Kentucky's neutrality in September and entered the Bluegrass State, Grant responded by immediately entering Paducah, in which he told the residents, I have come among you, not as an enemy, but as your friend and fellow citizen, not to injure you or annoy you, but to respect the rights of all loyal citizens. Grant's resilience to protect Kentucky is one of the reasons the Commonwealth remained loyal to the Union. On November 7, 1861, Grant will fight his first conflict at the Battle of Belmont on the border of Kentucky and Missouri. Although Grant was outnumbered, he had taken the field and was returning to his gunboats up the Ohio River when a Confederate counterattack caused for a Union retreat. Grant will still see it as a Union victory and an important and gaining experience that he will study over the winter. Also in Kentucky was another Union general and Grant's old friend from West Point, William Tecumseh Sherman. Sherman was given principal military command in Kentucky and stationed in Louisville. As Lincoln called for an army of 75,000, it was Sherman who was quick to point out that to win the war, the army would have to have over 200,000. Sherman's superiors mocked and humiliated the general. 
for making such a crazy statement. Clearly, Sherman must be insane. Although, the Union Army will eventually have over 2 million soldiers that served by the end of the war. The newspapers even printed a headline, General William T. Sherman Insane. Sherman shared with his wife that he contemplated suicide but decided it would be simply better to quit and leave the army. With Sherman ready to leave, it was Grant who encouraged Sherman to stay with the army. Grant will invite Sherman to serve with him, sharing that he had his back, that he would stand by Sherman. Now, remember this story as we're going to come back to it on our next chapter when we look at Shiloh. On February 6, 1862, in coordination with Naval Flag Officer Andrew Foote, Grant attacked Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. The Confederates in the fort were already in a miserable situation. Although the fort had 17 guns, most of the fort was submerged under flooded waters and they only had nine guns that they could utilize. The garrison of about 3,000 men found themselves being bombarded by Foote's seven boats, which included four new ironclads. Confederates were unable to return much fire, and knowing Grant's 15,000 troops were marching toward them, they saw it pointless to stay, and they abandoned the fort, retreating 12 miles to the east to Fort Donaldson. Grant will send word that Fort Henry had been captured and that the flag had been reestablished again on Tennessee soil. Hey! Now, you cannot see Fort Henry, which is down the river this way. Sure, it was submerged partially when Grant went for the attack, and then two days later, completely submerged. That's not the reason. It's because the TVA, and no, not the cool TVA of the Disney Plus wonderful series, Loki, not that TVA, not the Time Variance Authority TVA. No, the TVA being the Tennessee Valley Authority in the mid-1900s, decided to create this wonderful lake, Kentucky Lake, and it created a dam, thus completely submerging Fort Henry. So you can't see it. It's completely under there, somewhere in this water, just further down a little bit. This is the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, not the Time Variant Authority, a fictional Marvel thing. Don't call this TVA asking for Mobius M. Mobius. It's a fictional character. He doesn't work here. Don't call them, because he's not there. Foote will then move his Navy up the Tennessee River to the Ohio and then down the Cumberland River to Fort Donaldson, where Grant will march his troops the 12 miles between Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Grant's troops and Foote's Navy are in a position to attack the fort on February 14th. Brigadier General Grant has received reinforcements to bring his forces to 24,000, and Foote has 12 gunboats now. The plan is to be like Fort Henry. Use the Navy to bombard Fort Donaldson, and then use the Army to sweep in. However, there are some key differences between the two forts. Donaldson sits high above the river, has more guns, and nearly 17,000 troops that are well armed. The Confederates see the Union flotilla smoke coming their way and are ready for the attack. As the Union Navy gets in range, the Confederates fire upon the gunboats, knocking out the naval attack before it could even really start. Ironically, Flag Officer Andrew Foote will be wounded in the foot during a Confederate counterattack. The Navy will limp away from the fort to recover their losses. Grant will watch the defeat from the shoreline. It is not the Valentine's Day he was hoping for, but he does have the fort surrounded by his troops, and he's content that the Confederates have been cut off from a retreat. In the early morning hours of February 15th, Grant left the front to check with Foote, who was four miles downstream, and he ordered his men not to attack while he was away. But at sunrise, Confederate General Gideon Pillow attacked a Union right. Pillow, guess there was no sleeping in on his pillow, has his forces creating an opening in the Union line, leaving an escape route to Nashville open. 
but the rest of the Confederate divisions were confused, and not one division left their entrenchments. By 1 p.m., Grant has returned to find his headquarters in disarray and panic. Grant calmly orders to close the road and move fresh troops to the right in a counterstrike. By the evening, all ground gained by Pillow's assault was lost, and the Confederates were once more encircled by Grant's army. You would think after two days of besting the Union Navy and then breaking the Union line while inflicting heavy casualties that the Confederates would be in high spirits. Yet, the writing was on the wall, and they were in a terrible, terrible position. This brings us back to the meeting we started this story with, as both Floyd and Pillow were abandoning their duties and Forrest has left Buckner alone. Buckner will write his dear friend for an armistice in the early hours of February 16th. Grant is surprised that the note came from his old chum and not Floyd nor Pillow. He will reply to his bestie, quote, no terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. Close quote. Ouch! Dang! So much for being pals! Unconditional surrender? Prisoners of war? As the two longtime friends met over breakfast at the local hotel outside the fort, which will be later called the Surrender House, Grant asked, where's Floyd? Buckner replied, gone. He thought you'd rather get a hold of him than any other man in the Confederacy. Grant jokingly replied, had he got Floyd, he would have let him go because Floyd does the Union more good commanding the Confederacy. Grant did share one final moment with his West Point friend that helped him when he was penniless. Buckner, you are I know separated from your people and perhaps you need funds. My purse is at your disposal. Buckner thanked him, but did not accept the offer and will spend the next five months in a Boston war prison before being swapped in a prisoner exchange. The Union suffered just under 2,700 casualties, whereas the Confederates had almost 14,000 casualties. Now, please remember the casualties are killed, wounded, missing, and prisoners. Thus, 14,000 Confederate casualties include 12,000 that were prisoners of war. Grant's win at Donaldson was the first major Union victory of the war, and the War Department could not be happier. Grant was promoted to the rank of Major General second in command of all Union troops in the West, with only old brains, Halleck being his superior. But we'll talk about Halleck in our next chapter. The North celebrated the win with fanfare. Publishers covered the victory, and a photo of Grant with a cigar clenched in his teeth circulated in Northern newspapers. Suddenly, Grant found himself swarmed with deliveries of boxes of cigars as a way of thanks from well-wishers. One fan even sent him 10,000 cigars for the victory. Grant, who had been a light smoker prior to Donaldson, discovered he had so many cigars that he could not even give them all away. Eventually, he started smoking and chewing on 20 cigars a day. 20 cigars a day. However, the loving sentiments of Grant's fans in the long run turned out to be fatal, as the general tragically will die of throat cancer on July 23rd, 1885. Grant's capture of 12,000 prisoners was the most in U.S. history at the time. Matter of fact, if you add up all the prisoners captured by American forces from the Revolution, War of 1812, and a war with Mexico, Grant had captured more prisoners in this one battle than all of those prior wars combined. Dude, wow. The capture also gave Grant a new nickname. U.S. Grant became known as Unconditional Surrender Grant. Eventually, Grant will capture three armies in total. His first here at Donaldson, later at Vicksburg, and finally Lee at Appomattox. It should not be a surprise that Grant will capture more men than all other Union generals combined during the entirety of the Civil War. 
The Union victory and the capture of a Confederate army also caused the Confederates to abandon Nashville, allowing Union forces to capture their first Confederate state capital. Finally, the winds at Forts Henry and Donelson gave the Union control of the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, water highways deep into Southern territory. All right, guys, I am here at the Dover Hotel, also known as the Surrender House, which is just outside of Fort Donaldson. And I'm here with park ranger Blake Janda. Hey, guys. So Bla Blake, Blake's going to be with us today. He's going to be talking to us about the battle at Fort Donaldson and how U.S. Grant is going to capture the first of his three armies. Correct. Yeah, we call this our bowl area, and basically it is named that just because there's a ravine that pretty much cuts down the middle of uh, the fort proper that we're standing at right now. And this fort would have probably covered approximately close to 15 acres maybe right there. So, uh, I mean, pretty big. And if you can imagine, uh, we only have uh, one of these uh, log cut uh, reconstructed to show what one of them looked like. But if you could imagine close to four to 500 of these scattered out, throughout this area, I mean, it would have been a different scene, uh, basically, to go in and look at right there, especially during the time of the war. You would also probably not have uh, seen any of these trees. Most of all these trees would have been uh, gone out of the way. Uh, most of it used to build the log huts right there, used it for firewood, used in the defense portions of where you see the earthworks at right there. So that, that would have been just clear gone. What uh, ends up happening is here in uh, Tennessee, especially right there, when Tennessee seceded from the Union in uh, the June of 1861 right there, you actually have it where Tennessee had to decide we need to defend our borders right there. They could not go up into Kentucky because Kentucky was neutral at the time right there. Now, Tennessee decides, hey, we need to defend our borders. We also have to defend our rivers because the rivers were pretty much the gateway or the main highway of the time for any kind of traffic coming through. And here at Fort Donaldson, uh, what they end up doing is there was a riverboat landing uh, located in the town of Dover, just about a mile down, uh, we say upriver right there, because actually the river flows from east to west through here. So just about a mile upriver was a river landing in Dover that was used. And they knew that, hey, we can actually dock all our troops, supplies, anything that we need right there, and the fort will be close by. So. Uh, not a division, but uh, I want to say they had close to maybe four or five hundred troops right there. Don't quote me on it. But uh, there was uh, reinforcements that were brought in from Clarksville to help at Fort Donaldson. And basically Floyd knew that he turned over his command to Pillow. Pillow had turned over his command to Buckner. And Floyd says, hey, will I be able to pull my brigade out? If I can do that, then I'll be okay. And that's what he ends up doing is taking most of his Virginian troops out of Fort Donaldson right here. So a lot of the guys that ended up being left here at Fort Donaldson, the Confederates that is, uh, did not uh, have a uh, good thought on Floyd for uh, leaving them. Same with Pello as well. When uh, you have both your uh, head generals kind of leave and uh, don't do the surrendering as they should like Buckner did. You have Floyd that ends up uh, going down to Clarksville right there. Pillow uh, is said that ends up gaining a raft and uh, goes across the river right there to the other side and then makes his way on down to Clarksville, uh, on to Nashville right there as well. So, uh, leaving poor Buckner. Yes, uh, poor old Simon Boulevard Buckner is left. Now, uh, I think everything that goes in with Buckner is that they knew Buckner and Grant were friends and maybe that they could work something out, that they had the friendship, which a lot of uh, these generals on both sides of the Union and Confederate had during that time. And of course, with uh, Buckner and Grant 
going going to West Point together, serving. Uh, I want to say it was three out of the four years together. Or if it wasn't Grant who graduated first, but uh, um, I want to say he graduated 43, Buckner 44, right there. But you still have that relationship that goes in along the way uh, with anyone that you were with in a high school or college or anything, right there. The friendship goes into the Mexican American War as well. Later on, uh, Grant was down on his luck in New York, and Buckner was able to offer his purse to help him out a little bit. And so Buckner, in turn, whenever he starts writing his letter for Grant to say, hey, uh, you know, what can we do along the way right here? Can you give us time for um, to gain everything together? And of course, Grant's response was the famous, uh, we'll not accept anything but uh, unconditional and immediate surrender. And pretty much Buckner was taken aback by that because he thought that they would still have that friendship, but Grant was straightened to the point right there that says, hey, this is the only thing that I'm gonna serve right there or have. Uh, real quickly, in uh, a few sentences, why, if my guys are like at land between the lakes uh, on a little vacation, why should they come here uh, to visit you? You know, I mean, especially being here at a Civil War battlefield, it is one of the most significant sites that you can go to to have that connection with Ulysses S. Grant because this is uh, one of his first major victories that uh, getting in the Civil War right there. It's nice to be able to go through from everything to the river batteries to actually still seeing uh, the Dover Hotel, one of the last few remaining structures where a Civil War surrender took place. So it's great to be able to come in and enjoy and uh, have a uh, battlefield that you can do that at. All right. There you go, guys. Reason why you should come. Blake, thanks again. Appreciate it. I remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell. What do you think about Simon Bolivar Buckner all of a sudden finding himself in charge after Confederate High Command of Floyd and Pillow are like, yeah, see you later, the surrender is you. Or what about Grant capturing his first of three armies? Leave a comment below. All right, guys, I'm really excited about this series. Uh, up next, we are going to go to Shiloh, uh, in which Grant coming off the victory of Fort Donaldson here has been blessed with all sorts of cigars, but he's going to find trouble and rumors of his alcohol coming back to haunt him. As always, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I will see you soon. You're going to call him, aren't you? You're going to do it. Ugh.